I'm delighted, uh, Martali, to be, uh, be here in a conversation with you. Well, I'm honored to be I in a conversation with you. Yeah. Having read your book, I can see how learned you are. Well, <laughs> Much I, more learned than I am. No, that's not true. <laughs> and uh, 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 Martali needs no uh, introduction. And uh, uh, I'm delighted that he's gone through the book and we've had a conversation before about uh, his views on the book. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you'd like to start with some general impressions about the book or you, you'd like me to talk about some the issue of, say, the central issue of history, or maybe we'll come to that after you have some general comments. Yes, I, I would like to start off on a more general point than history, and that is that um, uh, I very much understand and appreciate your whole idea of mutually looking at uh, each other. And I also fully understand the point that if you're going to have a mutual conversation, a mutually respectful conversation, you have to understand the person uh, from a different tradition with whom you are having your conversation. But I have one problem with this book, that it seems to me that mutual conversation, mutual respect should lead to mutual enrichment. Yes. And my problem is that as a Christian, as basically a Westerner, and I've lived so many years in this country, um, I don't see you giving really any space okay. to the way that we have been brought up and the way we think. Okay. This is a very important point. So this leads to the history issue, perhaps, because uh, the central idea that I'm bringing out is what I call history centrism. Uh, which, just to uh, in, uh, give an overview, is, a, is the approach to history that God intervened in unique, absolute ways. These are non-negotiable. If we were to not uh, uh, accept these historical interventions as they have been taught, then we really have no other recourse. So the historicity of certain events becomes non-negotiable. So this uh, point of view uh, is what I call history centrism. And I, I make the case, I think, uh, convincingly, or at least I hope, that the Abrahamic uh, traditions tend to be history centric, or at least far more so than the Indian traditions. Now, uh, the issue I have with history centrism is the, it won't allow uh, an alternative approach which says I, I am a good person, like Gandhi, uh, but I am not part of that history centrism. Uh, but I, you know, if the person is living a good life and, uh, and believes in spirituality and, 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 and is very good to human beings, but is not part of that history centrism, then the attitude of, the, uh, of, the, of Christians, uh, at least the, the uh, clergy, uh, uh, you know, not all theologians, but many of them, has been that this won't do. In other words, unless you ex accept the historicity of the various claims as being true, just being a good person and uh, believing in that there's one divine and living a good life is not good enough. Well, you see, I think that perhaps that is uh, not allowing sufficient room for okay. modern thinking among Christians not allowing sufficient room perhaps for developments. Uh, when I was young, yes, definitely, we were tended to be brought up to believe that in St. John's Gospel it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore that means that uh, there is only one way. But actually, uh, it never says that in the Gospel. It just says, I am the way. So there is a way, in other mm -hmm. words. Perhaps it would be better if it said a way from your point of view. Um, but uh, we do admit as Christians uh, now, at least many of us do, that um, uh, if you place too much stress on the historical Jesus, you do end up in a position where it's difficult to have religious pluralism. Correct. But it was an Anglican bishop who said to me that he felt that religious pluralism was the greatest problem facing Christianity. Who was he? So he was the Bishop of Kingston uh, when he came out to India. Okay. And incidentally, when you talk about religious respect, it was very interesting because this conversation, this uh, remark of his came out in the course of a conversation with Molana Wahiduddin, who is a great um, Islamic scholar. And uh, 
when the Molana uh, was asked about religious pluralism, he said words to the effect, I believe Islam is true, but I respect, and he used the word respect, all other religions. Now, of course, the big question in that is respect. Mm. What and does it mean? What does it mean? Are they legitimate? Uh, well, now, uh, again, what does the word legitimate mean? Okay. You see, one of the interesting things, but first of all, let me just say one other thing to you. Uh, I do admit this problem about historic century, but I do think that a religion uh, with, um, with history in, is part of its theology does have some uh, relevance, particularly towards the whole question of uh, evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, because if we are evolving, then it's quite possible, in my view, mm -hmm. that during that evolution there may be um, events of particular importance in the evolution of our thinking. Yes. Um, secondly, um, uh, I do believe that the history, historic centre, we do have to be absolutely certain that we say uh, this is not the only way to God, and I would say that absolutely, definitely. But lastly, one other thing about it, and then I'll give you a shout, sure, right, <laughs> is yeah, sure. yeah. this that seems to me that in some ways you have a, a, a historic uh, a history in Hinduism yes. with Krishna's remark in, yes. in the Gita about yes. he will come yes. when he's needed. Yes. Okay. Now, the fact that the Bishop of Canterbury uh, uh, Kingston. Kingston. Kingston, yeah. Said that one of the issues facing, one of the problems facing Christianity mm. is this history centrism. Mm. Well, it's well, religious pluralism. Is, is, is religious pluralism. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but he did not diagnose it as history centrism. No, he, no. he said that there is, a, that there is a symptom called lack of pluralism. Mm. I'm diagnosing that symptom and mm. referring to the underlying cause as history centrism. I think the word, I can't remember the word he used, but I think he was talking about something slightly broader than history centrism. Okay. The overall exclusivity of Christianity. Yes. The sort of exclusivity which at one stage, but yes. no longer, yes. led the Catholic Church to say there is no salvation outside the church. Right. That sort of so, so if the lack of exclusivity, uh, uh, of course, that translates to lack of pluralism, uh, I mean the exclusivity yeah, that yeah. leads to lack of pluralism, mm. then my philosophical question is what causes the, la the exclusivity? Mm. And, and my claim is that there can be only one true history in a history-centric tradition. And that is the cause of exclusivity. So if I'm, if I'm trying to diagnose what causes the exclusivity, I reach at the doorstep of history centrism. And I'll give one example and would like your comment on it. The status of Jesus uh, is not agreed upon between uh, Muslims and uh, Christians. Uh, because being son of God is very important to Christianity. And just downgrading him as another prophet is not acceptable. And the reason it is not acceptable is because there is original sin, and this original sin condemns all humanity because of what Adam and Eve did. It condemns all humanity to all progeny uh, to uh, eternal damnation. Now, the only way to repair this condition, because God feels sorry for people, wants to repair the condition, is to incarnate the Son of God, and and through His sacrifice, uh, allow a way to uh, redeem the original sin. Uh, so, and this is the Nicene Creed. What is the Nicene Creed? Which is a required belief of all the Christian uh, denominations. I mean, I've gone and talked to many denominations and asked them, is the Nicene Creed, uh, you know, a, a belief that is required? And pretty much everyone has said, yes, that is what is required. Mm -hmm. So the, his, the history centrism is encoded in the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. Now, the virgin birth becomes important because uh, if he did not have a virgin birth, then he would also be born sinner because he would also be a progeny of Adam and Eve. And since all progeny of Adam and Eve are condemned to eternal damnation, Jesus by birth would be a sinner. And to uh, prevent that from happening, he is, he is the only person ever born who is not progeny of Adam and Eve because of virgin birth. So since he is God's progeny and not progeny from Adam and Eve, therefore he does not have the same condition that the rest of us have. Now, this is an extraordinary statement, an extraordinary belief, and a profound belief. And therefore, the, the Muslims removing that he's son of God and uh, the virgin birth uh, and saying we love him and respect him 
most serious Christian theologians will say that won't cut it because you undermine the whole system in a sense. <laughs> now, this is an example of history centrism versus history centrism. And now, to give you the flip side, if Muhammad is in fact the final prophet and supersedes the teachings of Jesus while respecting Jesus but saying we have a, a we have you are running on Windows 7 and we have got Windows 8 so it's more recent that's sort of the Islamic argument that not that Windows 7 was bad but we have a more recent version and therefore everybody should upgrade to it now if you take if you want to validate that, the Muslims have to not accept Jesus as the one son of God because a son of God cannot be superseded by a regular prophet. So he has to be brought down as a, or brought to the level of a prophet, a great one, a very extraordinary one, but still just a prophet. So for Islam to work, Jesus is virgin birth and Jesus is being son of God cannot be upheld. Otherwise, otherwise the prophet cannot really supersede Jesus. And for Christianity to work, that one requirement that he is son of God and had virgin birth is, cannot be compromised. So you have two systems of history centrism which, whose exclusivity comes by virtue of this requirement. But you see, I'm, I'm not sure that you're right on the virgin okay. birth. Okay. Um, that is one interpretation of the virgin birth. Okay. I was recently in the church in Eastbourne dedicated okay. to St. Mary the Virgin. Okay. And the priest at Christmas time preached a sermon saying he didn't believe in the virgin birth. Okay. Um, and um, one of the great debates, you see, Christianity isn't quite as written in stone, I don't believe, yes. as, as I think with respect you imply. And as you know, from the early history of the church mm -hmm. has been um, marked mm -hmm. by debates about yes. the exact humanity of Jesus and, Mary. and the exact, uh, no, much more importantly, the exact divinity of Jesus mm -hmm and the exact humanity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, people have been debating, there have been huge controversies, heresies, mm -hmm. councils of the church. Mm -hmm. Because, um, uh, but nowadays, more and more, mm -hmm. Christian theologians, I think, are saying that, um, or at least lots of them are saying that, you know, um, we can't be totally precise about these things. Son of God is another thing. Tomes of books have been written as to exactly what Son of God means. Mm -hmm. And also, don't forget the term Son of Man, which is frequently... Um, yes, sorry about that. ...frequently used uh, in, in the Gospels. Yes. You know. um, uh, uh, on top of which, I think, I go back to what I said that with the Bishop of Kingston, that I notice in general... Um, e even in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, that there is a striving towards making Christianity more capable of living with uh, other religions. As I said to you the other day, you know, there's been a wonderful book by Father Jacques Dupuis, mm -hmm. a Jesuit, an interesting... I ordered it already after you told me. Well, now, don't you think it's a good book? I'm going to read it's coming. Yes. yes. Um, uh, that um, and Ramundo Pornicker wrote mm -hmm. a lot about these things. Also. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, he wrote about the Jesus of Hinduism. If yes, I remember yes, right. yes, yes. Um, so there is this effort mm -hmm. to go, and therefore, <coughs> in, in a sense, if I come back to my original point, what we should be trying to do, I think, is not point a finger at Christianity no, I understand. I understand. for being historic centric. Yes, yes. But but, but to understand mm -hmm. ourselves. Each of us a little mm. better uh, mm. as a starting point, I think, is mm. a good idea. Mm. Now, I am aware that Christianity has been internally debated from its mm. beginning. Yeah. Uh, but there is the prevailing group and then the dissenting group. Mm. In any power structure, there is a center, and then there's people who are sort of shouting from the sides and they are considered heretics and they are, uh, you know, some of the mystics are persecuted. Mm. Uh, so, if you look at the trajectory of the power structure, mm -hmm. would you agree that for the majority of its history, uh, the, the trajectory of the power structure, not all thinkers necessarily mm -hmm. in compliance, but the trajectory of the power structure has been this exclusivity of the historicity? Uh, yes, if you put it like that, I suppose I would find it difficult to argue with that. But after all, what we're talking about is having a discussion in the early 21st century. Where things and, have changed. And, um, yes, where, and, 
and the whole point of our discussion and your book Yes. And many, many other discussions is... How to move forward. How to move forward. Yes, you see. I want to and get to that. Yes. One other thing I would say is that whilst, yes, I would argue that on the whole the exclusivity has been central to the teachings of the church and there has been the whole missionary enterprise and there was the second bishop of Calcutta, the famous Bishop Heber, who in one of his hymns talked about the heathen in yes. their blindness yes. bow down to stick and stone. There has been all that. Um, uh, but equally, of course, there have been uh, very absolutist statements of Hinduism Yes, as well. yes. And they are also history-centric. And yes. I criticize them too. Yes. I, I consider that turning Hinduism into a linear chronology of history mm. and claiming an absolute uh, uh, historicity of that uh, is a semitization of Hinduism. And I, and I mentioned that, and I critique mm. that also. Yeah, you do. You mentioned that in your book. Yes. Now, mm. a point I want to make is that in this research, mm. I looked at the official websites of mm. uh, most major denominations mm. of mm. Christianity, and and in the tab called Definition, mm. they always mention the Nicene Creed. Mm. Always, every mm. one of them. Mm. That these four or five articles of belief, which mm. are all history centric, mm. are the mandatory requirements of membership. Mm. And the Nicene Creed is actually recited in in. Uh, uh, in many rituals, in many ceremonies. Yeah, we recite it every time we celebrate Holy Communion, uh, both in the Anglican yes. and I'm uh, pretty sure in the Roman Catholic Church. In the Roman Catholic Church. But now, mm. so I think that the Nicene Creed, as in its encapsulation of history centrism, has been there, continues to be there, at least in the United States. Mm. Uh, I think maybe Europe is a less uh, a Christian, uh, uh, you know, intense, uh, mm. maybe the more liberal, uh, uh, you know. But in the United States, which is what the book is focused mm. on, I would say that they are exceedingly history-centric, and the uh, the uh, interesting thing is that the Protestants tend to be even more so. Now, the 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 engagement with Hinduism and Vedanta uh, from the Christian side, with Father B. Griffiths mm. and many others, and Raymond Parnikar. If you look at the list of Christian thinkers who have engaged with the attitude of let's see what we can learn mm. and what we can adapt and adopt. Uh, it has rarely been a Protestant. Maybe Anglicans are an exception. Mm. But the mainline Protestants... We, we, we regard ourselves as Catholics. <laughs> yes, I, 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 theologically. Yes. Theologically, you are Catholics. Yes, yes. And well, I could just say one thing as well there. You know, I think one of the reasons why, and this is a very important point relating to what I was saying before, one of the reasons why you would think the Protestants are more historic-centric is because obviously they don't have that same doctrine of the Church that the Roman Catholics have, and the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Church is a doctrine which gives the Church um, a, uh, a power. In, in, in your book you suggest perhaps that uh, the revelation comes entirely from the Bible, but of course in the Roman Catholic Church the, the Church revelation the also comes, no, the revelation comes from it as well. Yes. The doctrine, the teachings come from the Church as well. And people even like Cardinal Newman, the famous uh, British uh, um, uh, convert from Anglicanism to Roman Catholicism, who was only recently beatified, I think it was, by the Pope when he came to Britain, Cardinal Newman has a whole lot in his thinking about the development of doctrine. So once again, we're not set in stone yes. in quite the way that I think you Yes, suggest. I think Catholicism mm. has been more flexible than Protestantism in general, would you say so? Not with the exception of the Anglican. Well, of course, in a way... It's, I mean, it's if you look at Baptists, Southern Baptists, you look at yeah. Methodists, they're very fixed in uh, their, their ideas. Yes, I would. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I would... Uh, uh, I think I would agree with you. I wouldn't like to... Ups, uh, I, you know, I don't want to say anything against any no, of no, my we were. fellow Christians. But you know, here, here's, here's an interesting thing, Mark. When I talk to serious church people mm. from... The Southern Baptist, Baptist Church, Methodist Church. And I describe my term. They haven't heard of this term, history centrism, and they feel a little odd or uncomfortable. But the substance of it, they say, you know, you got it. You really got it. It is it true. This is the only historicity that ever happened. And this is important to know. And people who are being liberal and flexible and kind of they are they are they they haven't understood it. They are mixing it up. So in other words, that camp of his of ch of the church, which is very powerful in the United States, I mean, they elect presidents, and mm. you know, they they, yes. they are very powerful. Mm. They would say that this liberal thinker that you're referring to is not authentic. 
that's sort of their claim. And they happen to have the clout, the power to propagate and be in the school systems and control White House and all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Uh, I would, so I would say the, 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 certainly the religious right in the United States, mm -hmm. which comprises a very large number, mm -hmm. are history-centric without mm -hmm. even apologizing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, certainly the Christian Zionists who mm -hmm. believe that not only the, is the past absolute and exclusive, but even the future and the end of time and all of that mm -hmm. is determined. Mm -hmm. So they don't think that calling them history-centric is, 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 uh, is a problem for them. Mm -hmm. They think that somebody finally got it. Mm -hmm. And they have their problem is the Hindu guru, which I'll mm. come to in a moment, mm. who goes around saying that we are the same. And they can't stand it. Mm. Because they're saying we're not the same, because we are talking about the historicity, mm. and you are making a, a trivializing it. Mm. And so their view of a, 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 a very liberal Anglican mm. or a Catholic uh, would be exactly that. Mm. That, you know, you're sort of playing games, and you're not, you don't understand the boundaries, and this is right. Like Billy Graham mm. wouldn't agree with... Uh, a, a non-history centric. Mm. Mm. Billy Graham has inaugurated more presidents, you know, every president, mm. the whole inauguration, and he's sort of the, uh, you know, the, the head of Christianity, American Christianity, yeah. in the, in the figure. So if you look at him and uh, the mainstream uh, Protestant churches as sort of the voice of Christianity, then the very liberal cutting edge people that you're referring to are not in the power structure, in America at least. No, um, uh, I, think, that is I, I, I think again to say for my own church, okay. uh, the Anglican Church, the yes. Episcopalian Church in America, there are some very liberal thinkers, and okay. of course some of them are so liberal that they, they're uh, threatening to create a, a schism within the church. Yes. Um, but um, what, what I would say to that is two things. I would say, yes, but that doesn't carry our discussion any further forward. A, it gives you a base and, point. And it gives you a base Well, yes, in a way, yes. Um, but the other thing I would say, of course, is that as you have yourself said, a hugely powerful, perhaps the most powerful body of Hinduism in this country, powerful in the same way as you talk about the American Christians mm -hmm. and their power, is in fact, as you've rightly said, mm -hmm. a historicentric, yes. Semitized yes. version of Hinduism. Yes. Now, know? the Semitized Hinduism, mm. I think, is a recent phenomenon. The history-centric version of Hinduism is a more recent political movement. Mm. Would you agree? That is, uh, yeah, that is but not, not, is not something. But, but it goes back further than the BJP and, and, and uh, the no. Jan Sang. But it's still, yeah. it's still, in terms of the history, the long period of Hinduism, it's still relatively a short kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I, I would. Yeah, I mean, this particular version of it. Yeah, yes. Whether there've been earlier versions, I don't because know. we've always yeah. had, we've always had this idea that there's many paths and then there's this avatar, but somebody mm. else can be an avatar. Mm. So even if you tell a Vaishnavite, mm. I've talked to some of the. Uh, really uh, kind of uh, the ones you would consider very, you know, solidly history-centric uh, Krishna people, mm. Krishna Bhakts. That what if uh, somebody, in the Native, a Native American comes to you and says, we have a story of God visiting mm. us. Mm. And it's, got, it's a totally independent story. Mm. And almost every one of them has said, I have no reason to refute it. Because God may well have said that. So that, mm. that means that while I believe in the historicity of Krishna, mm. that doesn't mean that it's an exclusivity claim you see, the exclusivity claim doesn't arise because there is no condition equivalent to original sin which has to be redeemed, which only can be redeemed once by one Son of God. That condition, the starting point being, uh, is different. But there, uh, of course, uh, again, you know, the whole doctrine of redemption is under question, has been yes. questioned yes. before what exactly is meant by it. And for many people, it sits very uncomfortably because what on earth has happened? to all those people who, before Jesus died. That's a very uncomfortable and, question. And, and why is God and, in hell, according and to what me, But you see, I think, if, let's go back to this question of Hindu avatars. Right. Uh, the very idea of an avatar is historocentric, yes. uh, isn't it? It's an intervention, a human being But it needn't arrives. be exclusive. No. So my, my thing is that I think the important thing is broader mm -hmm. than historocentric. I think yes. it is exclusivity. I'm not denying that it, it, histori histori history isn't at the center in a way of this exclusivity. Okay. But the crucial thing that w we have to get over, I think, and the crucial discussion which could be held, mm -hmm. I believe, is 
how do you um, remain a Christian and yet not be exclusive? Excellent. So um, I've asked this question mm. to mm. several Christians. I've said, would you be willing to, uh, as a good Christian, uh, and one of the persons who's worked with me for one or two years is a, is a really solid Christian, a theologian, teaches, uh, and, and I've asked this question and she's been churning in her own head mm. while editing this book, mm. uh, her questions about Christianity, mm. and she writes an endorsement in this. Mm. Uh, and I've asked this question to lots of Christians, mm. Mm. that would it be okay for you as a Christian to have this set of, whatever set of beliefs you want, mm. but consider that this other person mm. somewhere who has a different set of beliefs about God and the nature of the divine could be that the final, the ultimate supreme being is feminine, not even mm. masculine, mm. And, and the human potential of oneness with God, all of these ideas that others believe. Mm. And uh, would it be, is it, is it possible for you to say that that is also legitimate, that is okay, or, or does it threaten you? And I've always found them, while being nice at mm. first, mm. And saying yes, we will respect that. Mm -hmm. But and after they've churned, they come back and mm -hmm. say, you know, it troubles me. Mm -hmm. Something about it troubles me mm -hmm. because my doctrine won't allow space for that. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Well, I think it is. It, uh, I would put it like this. I wouldn't quite use the word troubles. I think I would say that yes, of course. Um, uh, if you want to believe in Christianity, and I personally do want to continue believing in Christianity. And in a funny way, I want to believe in Christianity for a very Hindu reason, mm. because to me the doctrine of karma has been very important in my life. One of the reasons I've stayed in India is because mm. of somehow or other I believe my birth in India was... I think you were, in, you were, you were an know? Indian in a previous life, well, <laughs> and you had to go and do some things elsewhere and come back home. Well, maybe. Yes. Um, but as my karma yes. was to have been born a Christian, yes. and Mahatma Gandhi used to say, who you very rightly deeply admire in your book, Mahatma Gandhi used to say that that religion into which you are born is probably the religion which is natural to you. Yes. So we all want to remain Christians. Okay. We all know that uh, at the center of Christianity, there is a figure called Jesus Christ. Um, we all know that instantly Jesus is a historical figure because there is evidence for his life outside the teachings of the church. Um, uh, and we all know that this uh, does mean that uh, we have um, uh, to think very hard about how we can respect and live with other religions. And I've actually only, yet last week, I just completed an article for a book by, uh, in honor of the Archbishop of uh, Delhi, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Delhi, and I've written a whole chapter, part of it inspired by your book, incidentally, in which I have said we have to develop a theology of respect. Yes. And I think that is where we should go towards not have too many arguments about okay. history and centralism, and that is what you talk about in your book as yes. well. Yes, and I, I, I want to get there, I want to get there. Now, the, 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 let's look at the Hindu side of this problem. Yeah. Mm. The gurus mm. who go about saying mm. that, they, that uh, we are all the same, and Jesus is a state of consciousness. Mm. So it's not a historical person. I mean, I have quoted many mm. gurus who would yes, say that. Yes, yes. So their idea of embracing Christianity is a hug, mm. which a Christian like you would say, no thanks, I, I don't mind being hugged, but if the, comp if the cost of that is that I have to give up the historicity, the historical uniqueness of, of, uh, of Jesus and the virgin birth and the resurrection and the, the whole world, the, 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 what I have called the Nicene Creed history centrism, if that is the price I have to pay, then I'm being asked to compromise. So there is a problem from the other side also. Mm. The Hindu hug mm. through gurus mm. who think they're doing a favor mm. <laughs> and, and they're, they're naive. <laughs> they're not informed. So my book is also to inform them that perhaps a true mutual respect for Christians mm. would be that you should respect their belief mm. as being history-centric mm. and you should be okay with it. Mm. So the problem of being okay with the other difference mm. 
uh, and respecting difference mm -hmm. is from both sides. Yes. So I, 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 while we started this conversation saying that this is something, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm really pushing Christians to sort of respect those who may not have any idea of Jesus yeah. and don't want to subscribe to that because they have their own tradition. Mm. I have an equal problem, maybe a stronger problem, being a Hindu, mm. that a lot of gurus don't get it. Mm. So what do you think of the uh, Hindu guru who goes around getting a lot of Western followers who are sort of naive, mm. they're not to solidly in, in anchored in their own Christian idea, they don't really quite understand Christianity, a lot yeah. of them don't. Yeah. You would agree with that, right? Yes, There's a lot yes, of them who don't. Yes, yes, and so they love them reject it. Yeah, they just they just sort of go into this. Mm. Mm. And and then when some guy raises a hand up and asks uh, uh, you know, the guru, you know, what do you think of Jesus? I mean, he's not well informed. So he the the typical guru tends to give this answer that oh we're all the same, it's inside your heart and I mean, but what about all the historical events and the historicity? Mm -hmm. You've just sort of dismissed that to the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I were Christian if I had been given birth mm. due to my karma as a Christian, mm. I would say that's really not quite, you know, helpful to us. Mm. What do you think of that? The guru hug. <laughs> well, well, I, I think the guru hug is dangerous. It is dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous uh, for perhaps a slightly different reason to it, you say. One thing is about Christianity, one thing is about having an institutional religion, um, is that uh, there is an authentication about it. Okay. Um, it's authenticated uh, by the witness of the church down the years, by the historical event, the fact that there was a person called Jesus. We do know that he was crucified. And we don't. We can't be certain what happened in the resurrection, um, but we do know that something incredible must have happened because when Jesus died, the disciples, as you would imagine, they would do, were terrified and went all over the place. How did the church then arise out of this? I personally believe something remarkable must have happened at the resurrection. So, but all this is, in a sense, authenticated by tradition. Yes, the, yes. One of the problems with gurus, as I see it, is that the gurus are not authenticated by anyone. Uh, sure. Gurus are up and up, if you see what I mean. Ah, you, know, you know what I mean? This is my anubhav, my yeah. experience. This yes, is yes, my yes. truth. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, the, yeah. so uh, a very important, interesting but, discussion is Christians... Yes. Christians feeling that these that this Hindu claim to truth mm. not being history centric mm. has the weakness of moral relativism of anybody claiming whatever they want. To. Yes, the Pope would certainly say that. Pope, would, say, Pope would certainly say that. Yes. So, so you see the the uh, I am sympathetic in, yeah. in the sense that I fully try to understand mm. uh, what history centrism is, why it's there, and what its mm. uh, what its claims are. So, history centric claim. Mm. towards a religion which is not history centric mm. is what are your bearings, where is your moral compass, what gives you certainty that your experience was not a hallucination. Mm. Yeah. This, mm. is, this is what they would often say. Yes, yes, so yes. The, the differences as a starting point mm. are real mm. and without saying that one is superior to the mm. other mm. but calling them truth claims mm. rather than truth because mm. I don't in, in this book, I don't call either one of them truth or no, false, no. but I say they're truth claims. Mm. But saying that there are different truth claims, they are, they are divergent, they, these differences matter to their respective mm. faiths, mm. Uh, is a good starting point, I think, for both the gurus to learn this. Uh, uh, yes, yes, in, in a way it is, but in a way it seems to me to be um, setting people at loggerheads slightly still, you know. But let, let me come on to something. What would you suggest the Guru should do? I, I, mm. I, 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 we should also discuss mm. what would we suggest the Christian to do who wants to remain Christian and yeah. understand and believe in the historicity of Jesus. How could he respect the Hindu for having a completely different way of life and different worldview? But on the other hand, I also want to find out what do you think the Hindu should do who feels he has a universalism? His universalism is that you do this sadhana and you mm. reach a higher state of consciousness mm. and you need unity unity with God mm. and you do not need an intermediary and mm. you do not need historicity or you do not need mm. the church because all that is sort of gone. You yeah. can you can supersede all that. What, mm. what would you suggest that what would you suggest to such a person as a Christian? Well I think that I'm not sure that I have any absolute answer. But it's a good question. Right? What I'm trying to avoid all the time is to be absolute about okay. anything. Because one of the things which I really appreciate in, in your book is what you say about certainty. And I have written a whole book on the uncertainty of uncertainty, mm -hmm. myself quite a short book and not a scholarly book like yours. Um, 
So I struggle within myself, as far as Christianity goes, to uh, reconcile these historic claims with my conviction that the certainty of uh, uh, that we have to be very cautious about certainties. And I would say that as a Christian, we do have one fallback position, okay. and that is the great concept of the mystery of God, of yes. the great mystery. Yes. You know? yes. So when we think about that, I think there are two things which you'll perhaps underestimate on the Christian side in this book. One is the mystery of God. Well, three, I would say. One is the mystery of God, which does take us beyond uh, just bare literal historical statements. I, uh, that, that's what I think. Secondly is the great, greatest thing perhaps about Christianity is not the doctrine of, of um, uh, salvation, but why what the doctrine of salvation shows, which is that the prime energy in this world and the prime energy of God as well is love. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a, it's hugely, a great, great statement, yes. Yeah, a hugely important and profound um, belief. The third thing I think you're a bit unfair is um, I do think that the Holy Spirit is a doctrine of immanence, and you say it hasn't been well developed, but after all, it's been part of the Trinity, part of the creed but you know, since the whole business started. Yes, theologians, you know? theologians themselves, and I'm mm. going to have a discussion with uh, Francis Clooney, mm. uh, who is a well known theologian mm. of, of Hinduism. Mm. Theologians themselves say that Holy Spirit has not been developed, written about, theorized, explained. It's sort of there, but we don't quite know. We haven't figured out as much. It has not been promoted as much. Well, you know, I, I would have to say from my personal experience um, that uh, it was always explained to me. And I can remember sitting in the church when I was a university undergraduate, hearing a sermon preached on the Holy Spirit and thinking to myself that actually the Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity mm. who means much more to me than God or Jesus mm. does. Um, and I understood the Trinity from this sermon and from my own thinking that God is the Creator, Jesus is the Redeemer, but the Holy Spirit is the presence who is imminent in us in a way and stays in us. And even if you take uh, um, uh, the, the question of Jesus, we very often pray that Jesus should be within us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, but in that case, when a Christian sees a mandir mm. and he sees a murti, mm. the murti, the pratan pratishta has been done. Mm. So the, 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 the idea is that there is the divine presence imminence in this. Mm. Why wouldn't a Christian then want a murti of this kind installed in a church, in a church, mm. Because, after all, the Divine Presence is one, mm. and the Divine Presence in this particular village happened to be in that Murti, mm. and the Divine Presence in another village happened to be in that particular Deity, that particular form of Goddess. Mm. So, a person who truly believes in the immanence, mm. and that immanence is not history-centric, mm. would therefore embrace and allow all these Deities to be brought into the Church. Well, um, I think there's one historical answer to that, of okay. course, which is the abhorrence of idolatry in the Old Testament and in the Ten Commandments. Um, and I can remember as a child in Calcutta seeing these uh, puja processions with these colorful gods being taken down to the Hind to the river to be immersed. And I felt a sort of horror, you know, literally, I was appalled by it. But because of his because, teaching? Because, because of this question of idolatry, okay. which is so important, you know. And of course the idolatry, uh, I mean, it had uh, not been important in the sense it's important to believe in it. What I mean is it has been important. It's a historical condition? Yes, it's a historical condition. But a Hindu know. would say, and I've had these discussions, that, that the idea of idolatry in the pagan European mm. traditions from which the word idol was mm. made, the, the created, the whole theology against idolatry mm. came mm. about, is, diff is not applicable to the idea of murti. Because it is not that we are worshipping the stone as mm. a stone. Mm. We are worshipping the divine presence mm. as in the form of the stone. Mm. So we are not really doing idolatry. Mm. I mean, one could argue, well, Hindu theologians should argue, mm. that our murti is not an idol. Mm. Unfortunately, 
Hindus have started translating murtis as idols. Mm. And, and uh, you'll see Times of India writing an article that the idol of this is being immersed and the Hindus themselves have pay, uh, yeah. done this problem. Yeah. So naturally the Christian looking at the word idol and being conditioned that idolatry is one of the commandments, you know, you got to be against those guys. So therefore there's this problem. But what if we were to remove the word idol and we were to substitute the word uh, murti and one of my non-translatables in chapter mm. 5 mm. is idol, is murti is not equal yes. to idol. Yes. Yes. And to, to explain this very principle yeah. that now what happens to the church posture towards a form mm. which the people who are worshipping that form mm. are saying is not an idol, it is actually God's imminence. So you should translate it as Holy Spirit has, has taken this form mm. and be able to welcome it into the church. Well, you see, um, uh, I would say that a certain... Oh God, is that mine? Sorry. Let me switch to a uh, I would say that... Let's ask for to all together. I would say that... Um, Come on, get off. Interesting thing. Say yes. I would say that. Um, uh, um, I'd put it like this: that, in my view, the Hindu um, theology of an idol or a murti, murti yes. um, is perfectly acceptable to me. Um, I, I fully understand that they are not actually worshiping the murti, but worshiping the divine. Presence, presence yes. there, and uh, I would say that anything which is an aid to uh, someone feeling the divine presence presence is acceptable if the aid is not mistaken for the presence itself. Yes, and I would also say that in many Roman Catholic practices, uh, actually statues. Yes, um, are very important. But the Indeed. mainline Protestants don't accept that. No, they don't accept. No, that. no, no, no. So their no. their their no. their thing about uh, imminence is uh, further away. Yeah, yeah. From uh, what from, from, from the from the multi puja mm. than the Catholics were. Who one could argue that they they might be mm. accommodating. Mm. But you see, mm. the question becomes political. The question becomes if. Uh, they were to accept multi puja as divine presence mm -hmm. and were to were to accept a Hindu theologian's argument that look you guys have Holy Spirit so mm -hmm. here is a form of Holy Spirit that mm -hmm. came to my village mm -hmm. in my village this was Holy Spirit mm -hmm. so there's nothing contrarian to that in their doctrine mm -hmm. so the rejection of that is entirely a political rejection I mean they really have no logic they have no uh, there's no mandate that says Holy Spirit does not there is no historical exclusivity of Holy Spirit. So no, Holy, Holy we, Spirit we, could come... Well, I, th I think, I think the, the point... I think that being monotheistic... Okay. Obviously there is a greater sensitivity about uh, the imminence of God and the limitations you can place on that belief. And, you know, you talk a, a great deal about dualism, but I wanted to come to dualism in a minute. Um, you talk a great deal about dualism, and yes... In, in a sense, we are dualistic, and because of the um, uh, the importance of monotheism to us, um, one has to be quite careful about imminence. Otherwise, you could end up with what we would consider to be polytheism or something other than the monotheistic belief. So the idea of Holy Spirit as imminence has limitations because it cannot threaten the monotheistic exclusivity. It cannot threaten, uh, it, it can go up to a point, but, and, and, I, and uh, what some theologians have told me is that, that the Holy Spirit has always been looked at as some suspicious way of sneaking in something that could topple the real order. And, and so it's allowed to maybe, go up to a point. Maybe, I don't know that. Uh, I, you know, I'm not a a practice, I'm not a trained theologian at all, um, but my belief about the Holy Spirit, I think, and I would, you don't have to think a lot about this, but I would think, I would say that the Holy Spirit is imminent as, as something which can be imminent within us humans. Um, uh, I would not like to take the Holy Spirit uh, further than that, I think. Whereas, of course, I realize that you would take the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we would to us. the Holy. But after the all, the importance to me, really, 
Yes. Is that God is imminent in this world? Yes. You know. Yes, but then to us, to me, the reason we mm. would don't use the term Holy Spirit mm. because mm. we think it's limited in that sense mm. is that to us, Ganga is mm. divine presence. Yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. Mount Kailash is divine yeah, presence. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and the uh, sacredness of trees mm. and sacredness mm. of earth, Mother Earth, yeah. the whole Mother yeah. Earth is. Uh, yeah, yeah. So to us. Uh, mm. Excluding the divinity of all that mm. uh, is a, is sort of uh, demolishes the underlying philosophy of Vedanta's mm. unity consciousness. Mm. Whole, because we think, like in Sri Aurobindo's, everything mm. is divine presence because mm. it's the divine involuted mm. into matter that creates that becomes creation in the first place. Mm. So the idea that the divine presence uh, in Christianity happens in the form of Holy Spirit, which is, has some containment and limitations means, okay, this is Holy Spirit space, but this here is not. So now you're back to the sacred versus secular divide, which is there in the Western thought, mm -hmm. sacred versus secular. Now this problem is very uh, sacred versus profane, as they call it. Uh, now this is a serious yeah, problem. I don't like the word profane. profane. You know. Sacred versus, uh, you know, unsacred yes. or something like that. Uh, this is sort of, but the idea of Brahman, Sagun Brahman, as sort of the whole cosmos is that. Is a is a is a different concept than no, uh, and it would not allow monotheism to sort of contain it. Uh, you see, I think this is one particular area where, if we come back to what we were saying right at the very start, where mutual engagement could be very helpful to um, both sides, but particularly to if one has to use the word side, particularly to us, because I find that whole doctrine, the whole Hindu doctrine of imminence, actually enormously attractive and enormously uh, uh, relevant to the whole problem of um, the environment and all that has happened to it. And I find that the presence of God um, in the rare occasions when it really does come to be usually comes through the beauty of nature, mm. actually. Mm. That's, sometimes it comes through the beauty of liturgy and the repetition of uh, things words that I've known and loved for 70 or more years, uh, but often it comes to the beauty of nature. Mm. And when it comes to the beauty of nature, then you do feel this yeah. imminence of God in all nature. Sure. So this is an area in which we Good. should be talking to each other. And, and in this respect, I want to say I'm writing another book, mm. which looks at uh, the major Christian thinkers who engaged Hinduism and Buddhism mm. in a positive sense, mm. spent their whole life studying it, Panikkar, mm. Pete Griffiths, mm. uh, Father Ryan, mm. uh, Thea de Chardin. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Thea de Chardin wrote a lot of commentary on Ramanuja's mm. uh, Vedanta, mm. Vishishta Vedanta. Mm. Uh, he spent two years, a couple mm. years in India. Mm. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, for the last 150 years or so, 100, 100 or more years, there's been a lot of Hindu and Buddhist influences on Christian thinkers. Mm, yeah. And uh, Jung mm. had, a, had an influence, and before that, mm. American transcendentalists brought a lot of mm. influence. Mm. So the Hindu and Buddhist influences, or spiritual influences, mm. on very serious uh, Western uh, exemplars and leaders, mm. some of them official church people, some of them not so much mm. so, uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson mm. resigned from the church mm. in a famous speech at Harvard mm. uh, by saying that this exclusivity and this monotheism no longer uh, mm. no longer uh, suffices mm. and then he was disbarred for uh, coming from coming back to Harvard to give mm. a speech and he was a very big big name at that time mm. and he actually did that mm. and the and the reason he did that is is uncovered in a book mm. that we sponsored uh, uh, an American scholar called uh, Gordon to write called uh, Emerson in the Light of India. And Emerson had studied the Vedas. He'd studied, he, he was very deeply influenced by mm. uh, Vedic thought. And he'd come to this kind, mm. kind of a conclusion. So the history of such influences that have worked their way into Christianity in different ways mm. uh, is of great interest to me because I see huge potential. Mm. I, see, I see huge potential for this kind of work to continue. Mm. And probably the latest exemplar was Panikkar. Mm. who was really into Hindu mm. thought for most of his life mm. uh, while remaining a Christian mm. and wanting to see what all can be brought mm. into Christianity from Hinduism mm. and always struggling with how far can I go in the, Hindu, in the appropriation of Hinduism without, dis, without uh, kind of distorting Christianity or without undermining the basic doctrine yeah. of Christianity. So this is a sort of a, how elastic is the doctrine mm. question. But then I would say that's excellent work and very important but equally should you not be 
doing some work mm -hmm. on the influence of Christianity uh -huh. on Hindu thinkers yes. and the influence of Christianity on Mahatma Gandhi, who you admire so much. Yes, you know? I, 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 I um, definitely appreciate that. Mm. I think that's a modern, the, the development of modern Hinduism mm. in the last 100 years, 150 mm. years, 200 years, from Ram Mohan Roy, mm. yeah. uh, the influence to Ram Mohan mm. Roy, uh, and various others. But you seem dismissive of Ram Mohan Roy. Well, I, I, I felt that Ram Mohan Roy was sort of not very clear. He was moving mm. around a lot. Mm. He was he was a Christian, he was a Hindu, he's a Christian, he's mm. a Hindu, kind of he's both ways. Mm. But I think that influence has entered. Mm. Now, uh, so the influence has entered in both ways. Mm. Uh, but I think the, the asymmetry is there. The asymmetry is there. When a history-centric mm. uh, idea mm. uh, and a non-history-centric idea merge, mm. the history-centric has some minimum non-negotiables that it does not want to uh, give up. Mm. So it can assimilate the other. Mm. The other doesn't have these kinds of history-centric requirements that it will not negotiate from. So it is easier for a history-centric Christian to say, okay, I'll bring in yoga mm. and I'll, I'll cross legs mm. on the floor mm. and we'll wear saffron and we'll mm. do puja with agarbatti and we'll mm. put mala on Jesus and Mary. Mm. We'll do all that without tampering with their basic history-centric story. It is not possible for a Hindu to assimilate enough ideas, enough of the strong ideas of Christianity with, because to really do that, you have to accept the historicity which we were talking about. And the moment you do that, you become a Christian. Well, I don't think you do necessarily, you see. I mean, for instance, um, uh, you can certainly incorporate maybe the idea of love, which yes. is so strong in Christianity, you know. That, that's one that you could you know. Mahatma Gandhi thought, and of course this brings us to this very interesting uh, point that you made about morality, but Mahatma Gandhi thought you could bring Christian morality very much. I mean, he said words to effect, I don't care if Jesus lived or didn't live, mm -hmm. but I still deeply admire his moral um, teaching. Mm -hmm. So these are things which could be brought yes. But yes. you see, the problem in your book is that when you talk about enculturalization, which mm -hmm. here in Delhi the Jesuits do beautifully, mm -hmm. if you go to the Mass in the Jesuit um, formation center here in Delhi, Vidya Jyoti, uh, you will see that it is full of Hindu symbolism, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But you say, uh, seem to suggest that this is trying to steal Hinduism or undermine Hinduism. There's two, two points. Two points. Yeah, right, good. Good points, both of them. So the the, the point uh, about um, uh, uh, love and morality, mm -hmm. uh, there are excellent correlates. Uh, I mean, it fits. Uh, the The ideas of love and morality mm -hmm. are so profound in both traditions, mm. it's a good place to have a common dialogue mm. uh, and exchange and mm. learn and improve mm. uh, because the love and dialogue Hinduism has without history centrism. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I, my reason for loving someone is because the, in the ultimate reality we are the same. Mm. It is not that I have to love in order to get me to heaven. Mm. It, is not a, it is not for a reward. It is because the ultimate, in ultimately we aren't different. So that is a very profound reason for more love also. But, but uh, let me come in here. One thing, I wouldn't say that in Christianity you love in order to get to heaven. Okay. You love because love is basic, or you try to love, because love is in a sense is the basic characteristic of God and that puts you in touch with God. Yes, uh, so there is a dualistic love idea and there is a non-dualistic mm. love idea and Hinduism has both, the Bhakti mm. tradition has both, mm. the dualistic yeah. and non-dualistic side. Well, I was going to say that, exactly. It has, 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 has both yeah. of that. Mm. Now, coming back to inculturation, mm. the inculturation which is taking symbols mm. and is very explicit that says we are doing Christianity mm but we're using symbols to respect the local culture mm. is fine with me. Mm. The, the inculturation that I have a problem with is a bit duplicitous, a bit deceptive mm. when they go to a village and they, 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 the, the person doesn't even know that he's actually been shifted from his ancestral tradition mm. because it's done with a sleigh of hand. Mm. And I have been in Tamil Nadu, uh, mm. I wrote a previous mm. book with a co-author mm. uh, and, and went around and mm. had he translated some of the stuff and I understand what mm. the inculturation is. So their inculturation in, in, the, in the less informed places mm. has not been a sort of an intellectually uh, profound, uh, you know, mm. synthesis mm. of two traditions, mm. but more kind of a way let's get in the door. Mm. and become uh, received without any, uh, uh, you know, 
defensiveness on the other side mm. to kind of bring down the defenses on the mm. other side. So what now this takes us, this kind mm. of inculturation mm. takes us to the topic of missionaries. Mm. Other form of inculturation mm. which I think is sort of has an agenda to convert. So it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is very clear that I want to inculturate to bring down the defenses mm. so that I'm received and welcome. And then once I'm welcome, I go through the next stage of uh, saying, okay, let's uh, do puja to Jesus. Mm. And we're not right away going to throw out the local mm. deity, mm. Uh, but we want to just keep it ambiguous and undefined. But then as the person gets a little stronger and stronger uh, into the Christian side, uh, then we are going to, at one point in time, either for that generation or the kids' generation, actually abuse the deity as idolatry and bad things and throw it out. So if you look at how enculturation evolved in South America, which is where the church perfected it, mm. as a three-generation thing. Mm -hmm. First generation, get yourself invited in the door mm -hmm. with local symbols. Second generation, have both present, the local deity and mm -hmm. the Christian deity. And third generation, remove the, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, the local deity and tell the people that this used to be your primitive parents mm -hmm. and they were all bad guys and now you're properly Christian. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then in Africa it was mm -hmm. done. Now, now there is a whole, this kind of a theology happening mm -hmm. in India. So my concern is that, and this brings us to the topic of missionaries, mm -hmm. of, of conversion. Mm -hmm. So if we want to have a dialogue mm -hmm. which says, how do we go together mm -hmm. using good things from each other mm -hmm. so we can mutually learn and mm -hmm. enrich ourselves, mm -hmm. do you think it would be a good idea to say, okay, for 20 years, let's have a ceasefire on uh, uh, the you know aggressive conversion mm. uh, and let's create an atmosphere where there isn't mutual suspicion that you know on the one hand we're having a conversation mm. but on the other hand these guys boys are out there in the village trying to mess around mm. so why do, why wouldn't the pope do that i mean it would be such a you know he could pope could change the course of world history if he were to go out publicly and announce pluralism Okay, we're not against your forms of worship. We respect your, your, your claims to truth uh, and we want you to accept ours. We don't see any reason to go out and convert you and call you heathens and call you bad things and, and so on, which they do. Because I have, I mean, I go and film all that. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think first of all that um, if you look at the documents of the Vatican II, there was the beginning of a whole change towards other religions and yes. there's a whole document about the relationship of the church with other religions. Uh, secondly, of course, I, I don't speak as a Roman Catholic. I am very sure. much sure. an Anglican. Um, thirdly, yes, I think the whole question of missionaries and of conversion is uh, hugely important and quite difficult. But I think if you take the situation on the ground in India, and India is the only place I really know well, the uh, um, what I might call mainstream churches, certainly the Church of North India, Church of South India, which are the uh, offshoots of the Anglican Church here, and the Roman Catholic Church, are very, very cautious about conversion. They are. A Jesuit okay. said to me recently, a lovely remark, he said to me, he said, Conversion is God's business, and he doesn't seem to be very interested in it. Well, that would be a very good thing. Which, which I think but is see, a lovely if, if, if the Pope, way. If, if, I mean, I know you don't speak for the yeah. Pope, but if, if some people at the highest authority would actually go on the record and say that, because after all, they have so many official policies, mm. it's a very mm. top-down official multinational style management. Mm. So it's not as if everything goes and people can do what they want. Mm. It's a very corporate controlled organization. Yeah, yeah. The church is a multinational, mm. if you think. Mm. So why not the CEOs mm. of these multinationals, reflecting on what you've said, mm. make that policy and say, we don't want to be uh, upsetting people and, and, and bothering their cultures and going around sending armies of missionaries to convert. Well, you see, there is a problem here because one thing which the Pope feels very strongly is that he talks about, I'm not sure whether he uses actually this, but where's the effect of the reconversion of Europe and that sort of thing? Um, and he feels that uh, there are hard swathes of the world, particularly Europe, where which were Christian and which are no longer Christian. But he should focus and which on he that. feels yes. should be mm, become Christian. So again, what if know, what if we had a deal which said Hindus will help you re-Christianize Europe and then you leave India alone? Would that be a good deal? <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't think I, I don't think that would be the right way to put it. Okay, I think that would right. be un-Indian and un-Hindu. Okay. All right, all right. Um, I, I think I come back and back to this original point okay. that uh, please, by all means, be in India. You have been in India ever since St. Thomas, perhaps, certainly a lot longer than the Imperial Church came here. Um, and we are very happy that you are here. But to use your word, which I like so much, uh, let us live side by side with respect for each other. And that would mean, respecting each other would mean that, in my view, that you do not go out aggressively and try and convert people. You do not go around the place saying your religion is idolatry and our religion is true. Right. You simply don't do this that. Would be such a but way. if people come to you yeah. and say, I'm interested in That's Jesus, fine. just as I have come to you saying I'm interested in Hinduism, that is absolutely correct. Then, then that, I think, uh, is, is absolutely fine. Sure. But, but I do believe, and you would have to talk to the Archbishop of Delhi or talk to the Jesuits here, who I, you know, who we talked about before, ask them, they would be very good people to ask, what is their actual view on conversion now? Yes. I just know, all I know is that in the rural areas, it's like really he, big business. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of, but, but, lot of big but, but Raji, my understanding is that is almost entirely what I would call American hot gospel conversions. <laughs> I don't think the Roman Catholic Church is going out any longer. No, it, 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 it's mainly uh, Protestants and these uh, these Pentecostal types, yeah. but it's also Lutheran Church from Northern Europe. Uh, the Lutheran Church well, is not there. I've never come across that. Mormons, it's, it's a whole lot of different kinds. Mormonism of people. is are very quite different to Lutheran. Yeah, of, course, of course, of course, but Lutheran mm -hmm. Church also. If you look on the internet, uh, there you find uh, that you do find uh, very much evidence of what I might call American um, extreme Protestant attempts to convert. But you know, it's what but we can't stop that. Sure, you know? but but you know, the strange thing is that while Europe domestically mm. has become secularized mm. and less Christian, mm. uh, ten percent of or some amount of the tax in Germany mm. and some Scandinavian countries mm. goes to the church, mm. and since they cannot really use it for domestic Christianization very effectively, they mm. export it places like India. So they're losing numbers there and in wanting to compensate by, uh, by converting here, but it creates a kind of violence. Well, I would need to see evidence of yes, that. Yes, I, can, I, can, yes, I can show you that. Um, and I, in, fact, uh, in fact, in a previous um, book I did, mm. a, lot of the, a lot of these churches in Germany and the Scandinavian countries, mm. Finland, Norway, these mm. sort of countries, are exporting to India, while domestically the churches are empty. In fact, they're taking uh, Indian priests to preach there because they don't have well, enough no, priests. That, that is, uh, it's certainly the Roman Catholic Church takes some Indian priests to yeah. preach, but that I see nothing wrong, nothing with, wrong that with that at all. But let me say, uh, there's a very great danger mm -hmm. in taking this conversion argument too far. You, by if you take this conversion argument too far, you are absolutely providing mana to people who disgrace Hinduism, like Togadia. Uh, the yeah. head of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. I have heard Tugadia speak, and in the book which I'm hoping to get a copy to you of, I quote Tugadia, and one of the things he says um, to uh, preach hostility against Christianity is to say that these people are going out and that the Pope has a special army he's sending out but do you to think, convert people. But do you think the way that if they stop converting, it mm. will slip, slip, uh, take the thunder out of his speech? Yes, and that so, thunder, that particular thunder, So, yes. So, so uh, mm. if that is the weapon being used intellectually mm. and emotionally to mm. build up a huge political mobilization, mm. then why not just deplete that by stopping conversion? Because but, then there's nothing but, to argue about. But, but I think, you see, we're arguing that... Uh, we're, we're, I, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily against stopping conversion, okay, okay. and I think lots of us I think are, you are, you are against are, yes, stopping you. conversion. What I'm saying is that, as I understand the position in India, and mm -hmm. please do go and check it with authorities in both these churches, the two mainstream churches, the Church of North India and South India, which are both, you know, as you know, um, uh, were, were born out of an amalgamation of Anglicanism with some Protestant sects, and the Roman Catholic Church, are not going out and aggressively converting any longer. That is my understanding of the position. Sure. Uh, we cannot control sure. the wilder extremes of Just to American give you just to give you a little bit about my personal yeah. experience with 
Christianity and Jesus, which has yeah. been quite positive. Yeah. I, I was raised in a Catholic school in Delhi. I yeah. went to St. Columbus yes. from the kindergarten till the end. Yeah. I uh, never stopped being a Hindu mm. because we went to Chinmaya Nuns, Swami Chinmaya Nuns Gita classes. Mm. So uh, we went to many Tirthas. Mm. We, were, we were very much uh, with the Ramakrishna Mission mm. people mm. with various places. Mm. So through family and through my own personal study, and I was studying the Sri Aurobindo mm. when I was a teenager in school. So that grounded me. Mm. Yeah, and the, 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 Catholicism, the, the Catholicism of the school mm. was something I looked at and observed. Mm. It was not imposed on me. I mean, maybe things are different now, but at least in those days, it was never imposed on a person unwillingly or by force. Mm. Uh, and I got a really nice uh, education in the secular fields, mm. you know, mathematics, mm. physics, language, all these mm. kind of things I studied. Mm. But I, I, and I, uh, the understanding and insight into the Bible was sort of like, here is a faith that some people have, and mm. I would like to know about it. Mm. But as far as my own faith is mm. concerned, based on the Gita and the Vedas, it was never compromised. Mm. So my take mm. on the what I got out of it mm. was a, an exemplary life of Jesus, mm. and a lot of uh, things I can learn mm. from it. A mm. kind of a Gandhian view, mm. uh, not taking the historicity <coughs> very seriously, mm. uh, and actually most Indians, when I talk about history centrism, mm. uh, most Indian scholars, even scholars of religion, mm. hear it for the first time because they had they didn't know that it's such a big deal for Christians until I tell them. Mm. I tell them, go test it. Go test it and say, I love Jesus, I love his message, mm. but it is not important that he's historical. Mm. And then see what reaction you get. Mm. And you do your own survey, you don't have to believe me. You do your own survey and say that, okay, if the historicity of Jesus is not important, the, the exemplar role he's playing, morality, love, all, all that we think is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. So he could, he's, he's one of the greatest persons that lived. But the, the uniqueness of the, the Nicene Creed and history sentinelism is, is to be left out. See what you will get. Now, this discovery of mine, of the history sentinelism of the West, happened after I went to the United States. Mm -hmm. And there I discovered mm -hmm. just how fixated people are mm -hmm. with their history sentinelism. And that made me just go for 10 years or longer to mm. do this research mm. and talk to a lot of people. Mm. And I found that those Westerners who are in a yoga mm. center, mm. there's a lot of them in doing yoga mm. nowadays. Mm. When I asked them about history centrism, you know, it's something that they've tried to not deal with because it's sort of discomforting that I'm doing this thing. And one of the teachings is to transcend name, identity, form, transcendence, unity, consciousness. And you know, kind of a historical mm. approach, mm. but at the same time, I have not come to terms with with my traditional religion, which is Judeo-Christian. Many of them find it uncomfortable to have the conversation. Many of them are so excited to have the conversation because they think it will clarify their choices, mm. and they will decide where to draw the line. So I do get that mm. the, the person who says, "Thank you very much. I know if I want to remain a Christian, these are sacrosanct beliefs." And the moment I feel that that is being, line is being crossed, I'll at least know about mm -hmm. it. And then there's those who say, thank you for telling me because now I'm really clear that I do not want to be history mm -hmm. sending, which is why I came here in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you get a wide range of reactions mm -hmm. from Christians mm -hmm. in yoga centers mm -hmm. as a response to the sharpening of this issue of historic, historical uniqueness mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. So that's my story of how I came about uh, writing. Yeah, but let, let me say this. First of all, the, your experience in St. Columbus Church, I could find, think in my own mind of probably a hundred people I have met who have been to schools like St. Columbus, either run by the Christian Brothers mm -hmm. or the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And all of them, I never met a person actually who went to one of those schools mm -hmm. who said that they tried to convert. Mm -hmm. Never met a single person. So in a way that backs my argument mm -hmm. that the, there is that the Roman Catholic Church is not going around this country trying to do mass conversions. I'm not saying it didn't in the past. Um, we all know about the phrase Rice Christians, for instance. Right, right. Um, on this question of historiocentrism, which we come back and, and back to, um, I, I, yes, I'm surprised that people were not aware of this. I mean, I was aware, you know, of course, as a student of theology Indians. many years ago. Yes. We studied the historical Jesus. I made mm. a television program called The Four Faces of Jesus, which are four different interpretations of the historical Jesus. 
and theology has swung, uh, Christian theology has swung at times from great, great interest in exactly who the historical Jesus was to people, to theologians saying we can never know who the historical Jesus was. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm surprised that people didn't realize the importance of history. But you know, I come back to what is much more important to me, mm -hmm. much more important than the debate about the historical Jesus, is this whole debate which you do say somewhere, I, I've taken a note of it, let me see, which seemed to me to be the, the whole key to the book, um, which was really the, uh, uh, this, this idea of subsecola dharma. Yes. Uh, and the idea then... Sapeksha dharma. Sapeksha dharma. Yeah, I can't read my... I can't yes, read no, my yeah, that is, that, is, that, that is actually the center of the whole book. Um, and that this means that in some ways, uh, why do we want to get fixed on the historical Jesus? Yes. Uh, and the historicity of it, right. when there are so many areas where we could come to And I want to, I want to um, explore that with you. You see, I think one of the most fascinating things you talk about is morality, mm -hmm. and is this concept of an absolute and a personal morality, right. and this context, uh, concept of contextual morality. Right. Because, again, in Christianity now, this is one of the biggest, biggest debates, you right. see, you know. Um, it comes up in the, the whole area of the most controversial issues in Christianity like homosexuality, family planning, uh, mission of divorced people right. to, uh, to receive the sacraments of the church. All these things, uh, the whole question really is why as Christians can we not bring more context into morality? Yes. And why are is the Pope so afraid of the relativism which he sees this as. Yes. So if Hinduism comes uh, and explains, uh, as you have explained, uh, and talks from people's experience and everything, that um, contextual morality does not have to degenerate into yes. rank the whole, relativism. The whole dharma is like that. The whole dharma is like that. But this is a this is the sort of point. This is a very big type, a big discussion. But it's this is the sort of discussion point. you should be having. Yes. Because you see, the fear is, and there's a justifiable fear here, that what actually, you, if you call it contextual morality, could well degenerate into more well, relativism. I'll, I'll decide that what a more you know, relativism. Yeah, I, I quite like. Uh, um, getting drunk. So for me, yeah, uh, getting is. drunk is not important. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still loving God in other ways. Yeah. Or still, I think this issue, know? this issue has been so thoroughly examined and cross-examined and debated and argued. You know, the flexibility and contextuality of dharma on the mm. one hand, mm. and on the other hand, not letting it slip into anything mm. goes. This mm. is a very and who has the authority and by what process and what state mm. of consciousness mm. do you have the authority? But at one point. Uh, before we move on, uh, uh, you mentioned that you were surprised at my remark that people did not understand the importance of historicity mm. in Christianity. Mm. I was referring to Indian scholars, uh, okay. especially gurus, mm. gurus and mm. academic scholars. I, mm. I had a meeting, I had a, a panel discussion on my book in Delhi University mm. a few days ago. Out of the three panelists, there was one uh, remarkable uh, political scientist from JNU who got it. I thought he got it. But there were two social scientists uh, who just didn't get it. I mean, just, they just didn't. And, and then, you know, then in so many conversations I'm having, when I tell them why the historicity of Jesus and the virgin birth and the resurrection and all that is important, and you cannot just say, we'll take the moral lessons and live a good life, mm -hmm. and we are the same as a Christian, mm -hmm. because there is something different about the historicity. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with the basic cosmology of God, infinite separation from man, mm -hmm. needing intermediaries, prophets or son mm -hmm. to come and bridge the gap. And it is not for man to raise his consciousness and every person being able to achieve mm -hmm. it for themselves. Mm -hmm. So this fundamental difference in cosmology is very important. And I found that a large number of people in India are very confused about mm -hmm. this. And maybe it's the guru effect. So I was referring to that, yes. I was not referring yeah. to Westerners. Yes. I think that mm -hmm. Westerners are very clear. Mm -hmm on uh, the history centrism, especially I find Americans fi consider this to be a remarkable insight. Mm. You see, it's like a fish might not uh, experience water because mm. it just doesn't know anything else. Mm. So somebody comes and tells that, listen, this is history centrism. Then a lot of Americans say, but 
I never thought that there's something unusual about that. Isn't everybody like that? Isn't that the nature of religion? Isn't yeah. how could you be religious without that? Yeah. So that's my opening. Yeah. To, uh, my opening in the talk is to say, okay, how many of you think that history is important for religion, or everybody raise a hand, and how many of you think that if history were all gone, forgotten, or for some reason we just disowned it, that it would be possible to live mm. a good religious life? Mm. And very few people raise their hands. Mm. So this is a very interesting opening for me mm. to explain to them a different way of spiritual life yes. that yes. is not history-centric. Yeah. So that's why how, why, uh, how I evolved this book. Mm. Now, as far as common things, let's talk about that now. Mm. How do we take this, mm. this forward? I think that uh, the mystics are a good place, mm. that there have been mystics mm. in various traditions, mm. uh, and they have experienced uh, mm. states of consciousness, mm. uh, you know, and that I've discussed mm. in, this, in this book, the mysticism. As, but as you see a difference. I see a, I see a difference because I felt that the history centrism uh, in the institutional power of the church always trampled upon them and did not allow them to develop lineages because you know you need multi-generational mm. uh, you need a guru with a, a mystic or with a follower or to lineage than many more to really let it mature mm. and if they hadn't trampled upon Meister Eckhart type people mm. and many others uh, then I think there would have been a whole yoga kind of tradition in the West so it's a uh, the mystic is not a power oriented guy mm. So my feeling is that the, that that the society at large didn't go and give them enough support uh, uh, against the establishment mm. to uh, create an alternative uh, approach. Like mm. in India, if a, if a mystic comes and says, "I have had this experience," mm. you'll have a million people at his doorstep. Mm. Uh, so why that didn't happen in Christianity when there were mystics? And why they didn't get the support? Uh, uh, you know. But there are mystic traditions. I mean, for instance, the Jesuits have a very closely well-defined uh, tradition of mysticism. Um, uh, there are. Um, uh, I mean, I what what I what I thought where I did think there was was a difference was slightly different. Where you talked uh, about samadhi, right? Uh, and that as being a permanent state, basically. Right, right. Whereas, yes, Christian mysticism, of course, is not a, does not put you permanently in touch with and God. And that's very uh, big, big theological you, you, point. But what would be very interesting would be to discuss, though, whether in fact, rather than in theory, if I could put it like that, Hindu mystics do experience long nights uh, of darkness. Um, which Christian mystics very commonly do, you know. Yes. And you had the whole question of Mother Teresa's amazing right. revelation in her book that for years she felt out of touch yes. with God. Um, St. John of the Cross, for instance, is another one. Um, whether really, because you see, it's going to be misleading for people if one's going to tell them that there is this experience you could have where you are constantly on what I might call a spiritual high, when in fact uh, they're going to fall over the cliffs sometimes, as the Christians have experienced. But you see, this takes and, us and to... One, yes, one okay, more thing. Sure. If not, if it is right, that uh, if it is, you know, come to history perhaps, yeah, almost, if it is historically, experientially proved that you really can have this constant state of spiritual high, then it's a very important lesson for Christian mystics and people who are interested in mysticism and are Christians to learn. Yes. Now, this idea of Satchitanand mm. as the nature of the self mm. and, and as the same essence as God mm. is so sort of deep in Hindu mm. ideas, you know, in, among Hindu ideas, mm. that the recovery of that mm. being a human potential available to everyone mm is sort of a fundamental tenet. Mm. So to say that uh, I, the mystic in theory can reach a certain state temporarily and not as a permanent state mm. denies that that permanent state is his very essence. That is the very essence of the person. So the... the well, uh, let me do, uh, just interrupt there. I just yeah. want to be clear on one thing. The fact that Satchitanand is within you, in a way, and the fact that you are part of the, uh, of the, of the one great unity, um, uh, does that mean, though, 
it doesn't clearly mean because this is a fact as far as you're concerned. Mm -hmm. Sitting here, yes. we are part of the one great unity. Yes. But neither you nor I at the moment are, are realizing such a thing or correct. anything like that. Correct. Are we? You correct. Know. That is correct. Um, so it's a truth claim, mm. as is the truth claim you have about Jesus' historicity, which you got through historical, mm. historical institutional mm. transmission, because yes. you weren't present there. Yeah. And just like I haven't experienced mm. the Satyadarnanda that the Rishis did, mm. and therefore uh, for me to accept it is a truth claim mm. that I wish mm. to follow, it's, it's no more or less than your truth claim that there was a historical Jesus because you weren't present there either. Well, or your truth claim about the nature of heaven, that what happens in heaven is also something that the person here mm -hmm. has not experienced. Mm -hmm. So these are, I would call them truth claims mm -hmm. rather than truths. And, and uh, evaluate truth claims and truth claims and show and appreciate their distinctiveness, neither one necessarily being scientifically verifiable. But one thing I will say about the truth claim of uh, living enlightenment, mm. that in theory, it is possible to find such an exemplar, mm. in theory. Mm. It may be very rare, mm. but it may be you know, one person in uh, many generations mm. who actually achieves that. Mm. But in theory, since that is the essence of each mm. person, it is possible. Whereas in theory, to know exactly what happened to Jesus and where he was in the missing years, which some say is in India or whatever. Yeah, but, I, but you see, I, I think, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt yeah, yeah, you yeah. there, but I think these are two different things. Okay. You see, knowing where Jesus was in the missing years had nothing to do with mysticism, in my view. Fine. Uh, Satchitanand and St. John of the Cross right. are to do with mysticism. Yes. But, the, the, but the... And the I, think, I think, incidentally, that this, this is a particularly important area because Mysticism is uh, something uh, which in our times seems to be particularly attractive to people. And so we can bring people into a conversation through mysticism. Yeah. So if Satchitanand, mm. uh, the claim, mm. uh, uh, is in theory possible to verify mm. because a person could achieve it, mm. but in practice very difficult, mm. the claim of uh, uh, permanent separation of God mm. even in heaven is also one could subject it to the same argument and say, how mm. do you know? How do you know, uh, uh, you know, what is the afterlife? How do you prove it? it it's, it's, it's also uh, a claim. So we have but claimed yeah, the claims, both yes, sides. But again, then you see, if you're going to describe it like that, you've got to be quite careful because uh, it's not separation from God. Yes, I can understand where you're coming from. But there's also a closeness or a witness with God as mm. well. I mean, that's what mysticism is really about, an awareness of God, isn't there? You know? Yes. And if you read St. John of the Cross, uh, you know, it is almost erotic. The, the closeness is so close. But it's still, um, it's still two entities that are yes. intimately close. Yeah, but again, you see, uh, what, what I think we have to do time and again, and this is where I think your discussions could be so important, is we've not got to keep on going back, I don't think, to the dualism, to the history, the center, to this. Okay. We've got to come also, all the time, to what we have together, together. as well. So what we and, have... Uh, and um, uh, there is a very real reason for this, mm. in my view, which I wanted to come to before we finish. That is that uh, it seems to me that um, the more that we can demonstrate that uh, man as a human being in different contexts, in different historical circumstances has always searched for the divine, the transcendental. Yes. And that with many differences, mm -hmm. nevertheless there is a commonality a of quest. experience and a commonality quest, of yeah. experience. experience. Yes. Um, this is a huge argument. This is a huge argument against the ghastly people like Richard Dawkins, no, yes. who want to say it's all nonsense. And that's a great opening for a final point I want to discuss mm -hmm. with you, which I think mm -hmm. is bringing us together. Yeah. And that is uh, the way secularism mm -hmm. has taken over Indian intellectual life. Oh, don't talk about it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's produced a couple of generations mm -hmm. of people who are not only ignorant about mm -hmm. religion and not, not only have no quest and no idea about the spiritual mm. life, but outright hatred and cynicism mm. for it. And the, I wonder what you think of that, as a, because that seems to be a common problem that uh, religious people must be facing. 
I think it's deplorable. I think that there has been an impact of secularism, uh, not among ordinary people so much. Um, I think that uh, this has led, uh, I've experienced it in my own life, uh, to people thinking that if you speak about Hinduism, if you express admiration for Hinduism, you are automatically a uh, supporter of the VHP or the RSS. And this is a direct impact, I think, of wrong secularism. And I would also say that the secularist politicians are just as guilty of misusing religion as the BJP are. I deplore the use of religion for political purposes. By anybody? By anybody. Muslim, but Hindu, the, Christian, secular, yeah. anybody. And the secularists do it just as much. By, for them, it's a wonderful issue to beat the BJP with, so they don't want it to go away, actually. So do you feel that, the, it seems that this anti-Hindu kind of uh, public sentiment in the name mm. of secularism. I don't know if this was present in Nehru's time. It certainly wasn't, uh, I mean, I think Indira Gandhi respected, uh, you know, her religiosity quite a bit. So it seems to have been a more recent thing. Something happened. I, and, and something mm. happened and I wasn't in India at that time and I mean, I was visiting but not living here. And I'm wondering what happened that polarized this, uh, that there is one camp only that can champion Hinduism. And anyone who champions Hinduism is going to be by default branded a part of that camp. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any time I talk about why Hinduism is distinct or give a talk on it or whatever, then I have to defend why, you know, I'm not a member of BJP. Mm -hmm. And this is a very, very amazing, I mean, I don't get this question in the United States. I don't get, I, you know, Americans do not think that a person, uh, that an uh, Indian who's lived there for 40 years, uh, you know, if he talks about his spiritual tradition, that there's some kind of a political agenda or something mm -hmm. wrong with it, because Americans expect that everybody would be talking about their spiritual tradition. Mm -hmm. But somehow in India it's considered, mm -hmm. you know, suspicious. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you, have a, if you have an insight into why this sort of a recent thing. Well, I think the more prominent the BJP has become, the more it's become a major political force in the country, uh, the more that the Congress has hollered about secularism and given this mistaken view that secular, to be secularist means to be anti-religious yes. um, and that anyone who is religious is communal. Um, I think that is perhaps one of the reasons why it has increased. But there is always a certain strain Nehru's own attitude to religion was quite strange. Yeah, really. he was mixed up also. But he was not against it. No, he wasn't against it, but I think he, he was deeply influenced by Western rationalism. But know? Gandhi, for sure, mm. was very deeply immersed in dharma. Oh, yes, he, absolutely. So until then, things were... I mean, if he had it his way, if, if it wasn't Nehru, mm. but a Gandhian kind of a nation, then there would be more power in the panchayats, in the villages, and the traditional oh, yes. lifestyle, mm. the native mm. spiritual tradition mm. would be empowered. Mm. So it's, it's interesting that the party that sort of claims allegiance to Gandhi, mm. the Mahatma Gandhi, yeah. is actually in its actual views and lifestyle quite the opposite. Yes. Yeah. So that you share. Yes. yes. So uh, now the, 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 the academic authorities seem to, who seem to control you know, a lot of the textbooks and journals and uh, syllabus and what gets in uh, seem to be this view that we've just called the secularist mm. kind of a pro uh, problem. Uh, is it correct to say that this is a Western influence and that, that uh, it, it is, it's a huge amount of funding, whether it's the Ford Foundation or whether it's foundations like that, and I'm not picking on any mm. one of them, mm. but a huge spread of Western mm. soft power mm. Uh, through, uh, you know, ideologically brainwashing some genera a couple of generations of young Indians, taking them to the West, getting them educated, sending them back, has p produced this sort of an outcome? No, I don't think it's so much that. Okay. I think it's more to do with the whole completely muddled thinking about what is secularism, what place religion can have in the life uh, of the country. It's the sort of muddled thinking which leads to some of the absurdities in the West, like arguing whether it's right to celebrate Christmas or not, that sort of thing. Right. It comes down really to that. And it's absurd in India because India, you know, basically, apart from this academic nonsense, the everyday life of India 
is a demonstration that people should be allowed and are allowed and peacefully do practice their religion totally openly. You sure. know? I mean, I've often said this, but it's unimaginable in this country to think that anyone could say to a woman, take your burqa off, burqa off or a sada, you're not allowed to wear a pagri. Right, know? right, right. right. Um, so I think the academics who do these sort of things, and, and it's also political, um, because again, you see, when the BJP was in power, then you know all about the rise, about the history textbooks, and how the... the Big fight over that. Yeah. Big fight over that. Um, uh, and now mm -hmm. the Congress is back, and so... They want to obscure all of Pendulum that. going back and forth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yes. The, what do you think of Indian media? Because as a as an as a mm. important and mm. famous prominent uh, media person, uh, what do you think is happening in Indian media? Because I find it very strange. I mean, especially its treatment of religion and its treatment of uh, serious issues. Mm. I mean, I don't exp I don't get uh, this kind of a topic of discussion on television. I don't get it in newspapers. I see some pop culture and Bollywood and all that is fine. Is more like uh, infotainment, or uh, you know, my my idea is that uh, this Times of India is like a tabloid now. What do you think? Well, I think to be fair to the media, that I think in the time the Times of India, Hindu Express, uh, the newspapers, most of them do have comments, uh, not so much about uh, r religion in a theological sense, uh, but more or religion in a Political sense, yeah, the, the but, violence, but, the, the but fights. spiritual. Now, okay. They do that. Okay. Of course, the fights which break out from time to time are reported, but sadly, again, the background to those fights is frequently very badly reported. So everyone goes away thinking it was a Hindu-Muslim riot, when really it was some uh, Hindu politician or some Muslim politician causing trouble because he was going to get political benefit out right. of it. Right. You know? um, uh, so, um, you don't get, what, what you do get there is columns on spirituality. Um, yes. And the Hindu has one every day. A generic, very generic kind of, mm. not very deep though. Well, yes, but how deep can you be yeah. in 800 words, you know? Do you um, think the problem is that we do not have religious studies as an academic discipline in India, which in the United States is a very big discipline, to, uh, to take a formal university course on comparative religions and get you know, coverage on what mm. the religions are saying mm. uh, is, is one of the most widely, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, available mm. humanities curriculum, of course. And here we don't have religious, in uh, Delhi University there's no religious no, studies. You see, the, but you see, there's this, this strange contrast in this country. Well, a country where people of all religions live together uh, peacefully, basically. There are occasional outbursts of trouble, but there are outbursts of trouble almost anywhere. Um, and as I said, these are usually mm -hmm. political, not yes. religious. At the same time, you have a government and the whole sect, and very influential sector, in, uh, who say, don't touch religion, don't touch religion, don't touch religion. Right. In part, to be fair to them, in part it is because, of course, they see religion as being the issue which split the country. Mm. Um, so you think it goes back to that? And, and think in part it does, yeah. in part it yeah. does. Yeah. Because you know, for me to submit a book proposal like this, if I were to say a topic, religion, mm. uh, mainstream publishers are not interested, they think it's a BJP book. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they just don't get it. Yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, that, you know, that there yeah. is such a thing, there's a legitimate pursuit of religious philosophy mm. and comparative religion mm. as an intellectual mm. pursuit, and it has nothing to do with mm. any political party right now. So but that's you are being allowed to promote it. Yes, publicly. yes, yes. I, I, I am having a good time, and I, I'm, being, I'm being interviewed at a lot of TV places yeah. and uh, having a lot of events. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just reflecting the cynicism that's out there also uh, towards. Yes, uh, I, th I think it's fear as well as cynicism in a way, and it's uh, unsought out reaction. As but well, I must say know. that I'm very happy at the openness with which this is being received so mm. far. Mm. by uh, people from all sorts of mm. backgrounds mm. who feel that it, it's at least raising some questions they mm. want to think about mm. and starting some conversations. Mm. So that takes me to the final point. Mm. We're going to have a Banaras Hindu University event mm. January 31 mm. next year. Mm. I'd love to invite you for that. Mm. And our mutual friend Navarro is organizing mm. it. To continue this conversation mm. uh, with more people, 
Mm. And I'm hoping that uh, you can bring some uh, Jesuits or Anglican, uh, you know, theologians <laughs> or people like that, and we can <laughs> we can see the common ground more uh, uh, clearly. Yes. More well, clearly. I mean, I would be delighted to come if I can. I don't know that I can summon Jesuits or Anglicans, but okay. Uh, but as uh, yourself. Yes. Uh, yes, if I can, sir. Yes. Yeah, and maybe you can bring some other people also, mm. and we can continue this mm. discussion. Yeah. yeah? Would you yeah. like to do that? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, do you would you have any closing remarks, uh, or or? No, my only only closing remark would be that I hope that from this book arises another book that Rajiv will write, which will be one which will now look at not just uh, looking at each other with mutual respect, but achieving mutual benefit out of that respect. Yeah, and I definitely want to make this, uh, take this up as a commitment from my side because I am working on what would be, what would be a spiritual path which doesn't compromise the minimum requirements of either and gives the maximum benefit to each other. Is that, that's I think in a nutshell. Well, that's that, but, but also as a I philosophical think, inquiry. But also I think uh, very importantly to demonstrate to the world that uh, the, there is a common experience of religion, yes. of God, of transcendent, call it whatever you like, yes. uh, which is common to all men at all times in their history. Yes. It has been affected, as you rightly say, all transmission of wisdom, uh, of enlightenment, transmission of enlightenment to others, is always affected yes. by history, by individuals' perceptions, by cultures they have learned, but still underlying it all there is, and that we are all engaged on a common enterprise as well. That's wonderful. And thank you, Mark, for taking the time. This has been an honor and a pleasure, pleasure. for me to do that. Great pleasure for me. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.